Who is Troy LaRabie? Is he a brilliant mind with a keen eye on what it takes to improve schools? Is he a believer in children's potential? Or is he a troublemaker, rabble-rouser, and gadfly who deflects shortcomings to hide weaknesses? Why did Troy LaRavier get demoted as a Chicago Public Schools principal? And why did Andrea Zopp get promoted to deputy mayor by Rahm Emanuel? <laughs> After approving a $20 million no-bid contract with fellow board members, Chicago, the city that works for the chosen few, and how a fired administrator became the president of the Principals Association on Counterpoint with Gerard McClendon. Imagine yourself a third grade teacher in a low income community and you just received a classroom full of students who are two years behind. Imagine there's another third grade teacher in a high income community just received a classroom full of students that are two years ahead. And at the end of that year, you've moved those students a full year and a half in one year, but they're still a year behind and their test scores are going to show it. And the teacher in the high income community moved her kids about a half a year, but they're still ahead. The test scores are going to show who's doing better. If we just look at attainment, right? The teacher in the high income community. Whereas we all know, if you move kids a year and a half in a year, and the test scores aren't showing it, something's wrong. And so one of the things that happened with CPS, when they began to talk about evaluating teachers based on test scores, they chose a measure that measured student growth over overall student, rather than overall student attainment. And so how did students grow? That's the promoted, demoted, and promoted president of the Principals Association. Hey, thank you for joining us on CounterPoint. Call me at 844-777-9311. You can tweet me at Gerard MC and send Facebook comments to CounterPoint Gerard. Joining me at the CounterPoint is the intelligent, magnetic, and fearless Troy LaRavier. Troy, how you doing this evening? <laughs> I'm good. Brother. It's good, good to see you, man. It's good I've, to see a chuckle out of you. I've you know, I've never heard <laughs> myself described with those adjectives before. <laughs> it's all good because, see, here's the thing. You know, it's good to see you laugh because things have been real serious for you lately, brother. And you know, in the city of Chicago, the city that works, the city of big shoulders, there's a lot of corruption that takes place, and it seems like a voice like yours is a voice in the wilderness that's a positive voice. You know, we've been looking at silly things like I have tuition to pay and I have casinos to visit. Barbara Bird Bennett, mm -hmm. you know, basically gets removed, you know, uh, you know, $20 million no bid contract. Troy LaRavier is trying to do the best job he can at Blaine Elementary, but it seems like you're getting backlash first and foremost man what makes you tick what makes you challenge the powers that be and what makes you love children so much man well i mean like anyone i have several different strands of my life that could answer that question you know the story of my mother uh the story uh, of my ascension to pr the principalship at blaine and how that connects with her the redemption of her uh her city wanting a city that my son can grow up in with an educational system. So, you know, like, I think my son is the greatest example, you know, in terms of how I see him. You know, I want him to grow up in a city that has an opportunity for him, that's safe for him, where he can grow up and make a life for himself, right? And the city that he inherits, he's not going to inherit by himself, right? He's going to inherit Chicago with every other third grader out there. Mm. They're all going to grow up, and what Chicago becomes is going to be what they become. So what we prepare them with now determines the future of the city he grows up in. So if I care about the Chicago he grows up in, I have to care as much about their education, or maybe even more, yeah. than I do about his education, because they're going to create the city he inhabits. Yeah. 
Yeah, let's let's go into that. And, and I want to do that by looking at your bio. Uh, where did you go to? Where did you grow up, first of all? Chicago, uh, the low end, 43rd Street, Inglewood, back of the yards. We moved all over the place. What elementary school did you go to? I was, again, <laughs> Altgelb, Carter, Sherman, and Mollison. And then I went to Dunbar High School. Wow, undergrad. Uh, University of Illinois in Champaign, but that was after uh, spending some time in the Navy. Okay, okay. Any schooling after undergrad? Uh, Masters, University of Illinois, Champaign. I did uh, some doctorate work, University of Illinois, Champaign. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you've been known to get student performance gains. You've been known for getting morale boosting in your schools. Uh, it's, it, the word is out that parents love you. Uh, that you bring integrity to the elementary schools in Chicago. How does an individual like yourself get ousted? What, what happened, so Mr. I'll, LaRavier? I'll, I'll address the first as a way to get to the question. Mm -hmm. So we, we got the results that we got through a very simple philosophy, uh, incredibly simple. You take the things that have been proven in the research to work, right? You know, education actually has research, a research base, just like medicine, right? Yes, yes it you does. don't just do things off the top of your head. You don't just come up with some idea and just implement it <laughs> across a school or across a school district. I mean, it's good to innovate, and you, and you innovate on a small level to test it before you expose people to something that might not be working. <laughs> you want to test it. So we take the ideas that have been proven to work. Mm -hmm. and we implement them. It's that simple. We give teachers, you know, the, the, the freedom to, in, to, to uh, improvise, you know, according to their own individual circumstances. It's not lockstep, but you basically take the things that have been proven to work and you implement them. But I work in a district that oh. has the opposite philosophy, mm -hmm. right? Most of their school reforms are ideolo ideologically driven and they're scientifically baseless. They have no research base behind them. They're ideas that come from the business community. This stuff is this stuff is willy nilly. I mean, why is it put into place, Mr. Laravier, if they don't? I mean, they obviously think that the research works and that the things that they implement work. I mean, I know we live in this work to do what? Well, I know we live in this ocean <laughs> of acronyms, right. you know, and I had to write them all down. I mean, we looking at Park. SAT, ACT, TAP, ED, TPA, you're dealing with Common Core, REACH, uh, MTSS, RTI, I mean, so all of this stuff, Charlotte Danielson, all this stuff is just forced upon principals and teachers for some apparent reason. Come on, Mr. LaRavier. I mean, is, is, it, is it not functional? So you said it works. I, no, uh, I didn't say it works. I'm just saying why they, they think it works, yeah, so they, yeah, it's you implemented. Said they think it works. Mm -hmm. They think it works to do what? The thing that it works to do is profit, right? It creates profit for private investors, whether it be the testing, whether it be the charter schools, whether it be the choice movement, all of these things work to create profit. They work to take taxpayer dollars away from the things that provide direct services to children and students mm -hmm. and direct those or redirect those tax dollars towards some private investor's profit margin. Mm -hmm. But they have not been shown to work. As a matter of fact, they've been shown to do the opposite in terms of uh, achievement for students. They've been shown to depress achievement mm -hmm. for students. They've been, but they have not been shown to uplift that achievement. So it's a cash grab. That's exactly what Standardized it is. Standardized test, if, if, if I am the creator of a standardized test, if I can get 40 to 60% of the students to fail, I can stay in business because I can keep selling that test to a school district, you know? And, and I, I've noticed how, even with Common Core, I've noticed how the emphasis doesn't seem as if the student is even in mind. Do you agree? So it's not just being able to sell a test. You have to be able to sell the idea that public schools are failing. Mm. Right? And so if you can sell the idea that public schools are failing, which we're not, public schools do better with the students we get than any other kind of school in this nation. You know, I, don't, I think you played a, a clip earlier where I talked about the difference between teachers who 
get students who are two years behind mm -hmm. and those who get students who are two years ahead. If you look at what those teachers do with those students, what the research shows is that public schools get more student growth. We may get students who start with us behind, but we do more to grow those students than any other kind of school. Hmm. Um, so you have to sell the idea, though, mm -hmm. that public schools are failing. Hmm. And, right, and public schools are not failing. What's happening is that our students are being failed before they, how can you have a situation where the students come into kindergarten in a low-income community, kindergarten on day one, up to four years behind hmm. their peers in a high-income community? How in the world can that be the fault of the school? And this is day one. They've right. never been in the school, and they're already four years behind. Hmm. Those students have been failed by the business and political community long before they ever reach a school. But they try to paint this picture of the school as failing. They blame the school for failing the kids. But what's, what's really going on is the school isn't working miracles to undo the failure that happened long before those children ever reached the school. Got you, got you. So let's And that failure is the failure of the political community. So in, it's... You know, it's ironic that it's the political and elected officials who failed the children in the first place who are now trying to put the blame on the teachers for not being able to compensate for their failure. Do you Let me give you a quick example because okay. i got to make this real. Yes, sir. So one of the things that leads to um, this uh, achievement gap, for example, is exposure to lead paint. If I'm in Chicago and I live in Lincoln Park, and I'm a child in Lincoln Park. I have a 0% chance of being exposed to lead paint. If I live in Austin on the west side, you know what my chances are? What are they? One in four. And so that means one in four out of children in, all, in Austin are going to be subjected to the risk of the cognitive function yeah. difficulties that happen when you are exposed to lead paint. But it doesn't stop there. When those children in Lincoln Park get to school, those teachers don't have to deal with those cognitive difficulties. Mm. They don't have to compensate for that. But when those children in Austin get to school, then those teachers are charged with compensating for the failure of the elected officials to take care of the housing in those communities. And guess what? Ron, I mean, this particular administration cut the lead paint abatement program by more than $3 million. Okay, so when we come back after the right. break, they cut the lead abatement program. We've had 50 schools closed. I saw in an interview where you said that 307, Rahm Emanuel had 373 meetings. Mm -hmm. We want to talk about that after the break as well as this $20 million no bid contract. I sure. mean, you're a voice out there and I'm going to give you some pushback after the break, but it seems as if you are being almost targeted and punished for telling the truth. Do you believe that? Yeah. Okay, we're going to come back to that after the break. I hey. mean, it's pretty obvious. <laughs> yes, sir. Hey, what is the price of integrity? Are you willing to sacrifice yourself for the greater good? Here are a few thoughts from you and we, the people. Melody Heller writes, if if the circumstances surrounding sacrifice for safety or well-being of another person, sometimes you have to make a stance in order to ensure progress for someone who is, for some reason, unable to do for him or herself. Tony Lynch says, yep, we'll always stand up and do the right thing. And Aaron Eubank says, I would sacrifice pay so that everyone can eat in the world as we know it today. I personally believe in sacrifice, but I understand why sacrifice won't be made as a general public. Tell me how you really feel. Call me 844-777-9311. Tweet me at Gerard MC. Facebook comments to Counterpoint Gerard and we will be back shortly with Troy Ravier. Tweet me, post on Instagram or send me a message on Facebook. Let's start the conversation. Your voice is important on Counterpoint. and school officials who raise and spend and borrow money in a manner that is reckless and corrupt, the parasitic private sector, banks and investors who are always looking for creative ways to rip off taxpayers, and the state legislators who are eager to create a legislative environment 
in which this legalized theft can occur. If anyone is made to sacrifice, it has to be members of these three groups. The, because the behavior of teachers didn't cause this problem. The behavior of the people in these three groups caused this problem. Teachers have already made their sacrifice a thousand times over. And those whose behavior caused this sacrifice have no right to ask them for any more. Welcome back to Counterpoint. Hey, we're having a discussion with CPS principal and the new president of the Principals Association, Mr. Troy LaRavier. Troy, thanks for staying with us in the second segment. I really appreciate it. You know, I got a lot on my table here, man. Everything from Sodexo to the $17 million bond, interest rates, $10 million worth of furniture. But let's talk about, you know what, let me, let, me, let, me bring it, let me bring it low. Do you miss Blaine, man? Have they banned you from the school? I've been banned from all CPS facilities. You can't go inside any CPS facility. Right. And what if you just happen to show up at Blaine one day? What might happen? I don't think anything will happen. Um, I just think it would be used against me in the proceedings. Because yeah. uh, the proceedings to dismiss me are still ongoing. Okay, okay. Yeah. 373 meetings. You got mad beef with the mayor of the city of Chicago. You mentioned 373 meetings pertaining to what the Rahm Emanuel went to. So that was in relationship to a question that uh, a reporter uh, or a commentator asked me about schools being his priority. He said, you know, the, well, the mayor says, you know, the kid, it's all about the kids. And I said, I believe in evidence. When, anytime you have an opinion or an accusation, you have to have evidence to back it up. That's my, that's my gold standard, evidence. And so what is the evidence to say he either does or does not have students as a priority or Chicago as a priority, period? And so I talked, about, uh, I talked to him about the uh, Tribune front page headline. It was uh, Inside Rahm Emanuel's Political Cash Machine, where they showed that 60 of his top 100 donors all got some kind of benefit from the city, either in appointments or city contracts. They make a donation, they get a benefit. They make a donation, they get our tax dollars. Mm -hmm. And as a subpart of this article, they analyzed his calendar and found that in 2013 and 2014, he had over 370 something, 373 or 376 meetings with his campaign donors. 376 mm -hmm. meetings with campaign donors or appearances with so campaign donors. So what's wrong donors. with that? And so that means he spent over half his days catering to the greed of his campaign donors while ignoring the needs of Chicago's residents. And so to put that in perspective, I say, imagine what the difference might have been if he had 376 meetings on curbing the violence in our streets with community members and law enforcement officials mm -hmm. and social service providers. Imagine if he had 376 meetings with stakeholders about increasing economic activities in blighted neighborhoods. Imagine if he had 376 meetings on generating revenue for our school systems and for the services that our city needs. But no, he had 376 meetings that were designed to cater to the greed of his campaign donors. Let me ask so you that this. shows, yeah. that, so that's the answer to the question. You see what someone's priority is in terms of how they spend the city, how they spend the city resources and how they spend their time. That's evidence. Do you believe in an elected school board? Yes and no. Um, I believe in a representative school board. Do you think that the mayor of Chicago would be more accountable with an elected school board? Or, or does it depend on who those elected board members are? Well, then the, the mayor would be taken out of the uh, picture if the school board were elected. Mm -hmm. You know, he wouldn't have much of, res of a responsibility. Um, the school, the, whatever the governance structure of the school board is, that governance structure needs to be held accountable. So right now it's the mayor, so he's the one that's supposed to be held accountable. It's obviously not working. Yeah. Um, but if you have a school board, I think a representative board would make better decisions. Mm -hmm. And there's certain things you can do to make right. it more representative, just making it elected. I mean, you know, he was elected, right. and that, look at where that got us. Right. So you can buy an election. You can flood the airways with commercials uh, and buy an election. You I, think you were targeted uh, because the mayor may want uh, 
unchallenged loyalty from his principals and administrators and teachers? Do well, you see, I mean, that's a means to an end, right? You want unchallenged loyalty for what reason? You have an objective that you don't want anything blocking your, the direction or the path toward that objective. And this it's not just the mayor. You know, the mayor is the face. It's a system? To a much larger beast behind him. It is the mayor's office, and that office is filled with people who work on behalf of the real estate developers, the campaign donors, the investment bankers, and they have an agenda, and that agenda is to take every dime they can of our tax dollars and redirect it toward their profit margins. Mm -hmm. it, it is a machine they put together, and it works really well, and when they run out of dollars, our tax dollars, they take out loans so that they can get our future tax dollars and then direct those loan funds toward their campaign contributors. You know, yeah. the example that I give a lot is that really illustrates is, is the pre-K loan. They borrowed $17 million supposedly to expand pre-K. Pre-K never got expanded, by the way. <laughs> and they um, said they were going to pay these folks almost double to uh, if they won't pay all them double in return, so $34 million. And the catch, the way they sold it, was that they'll only give them double if the kids who get pre-K outscore the kids who don't get pre-K. Well, of course the kids who get pre-K are, out, are gonna That's outscore the obvious, kids who get pre-K. Yeah. You don't pay double for something because it does what it's supposed to do. That's like you going to your plumber and saying, you know, what's it gonna be? What's the charge gonna be? And he says $10,000. And you say, well, I'll give you 20,000 if the pipes don't leak. Mm. No one is that irresponsible with their own money. But this administration will be that irresponsible with our tax dollars if they can get those tax dollars to their campaign contributors. And who were those lenders who lent that $17 million? Goldman Sachs, mm. Rahm Emanuel campaign contributor. Northern Trust, Rahm Emanuel campaign contributor. And so that's just one example of a machine they've put together to take our, and that's our future tax Paper dollars. Trail, yes. right? That's a loan. That means our children are going to be paying back Goldman Sachs. And we got, Sachs junk, we got junk bond trust. ratings too. Exactly. You know, we're not exactly getting a 1% interest rate. So remember, this started from a question about you asking about loyalty, right? It's about not being able, so what they've done to me is about taking out an obstacle to that, that well-oiled machine that transfers, wealth from, transfers the wealth of this city from being, from being put in the service of our residents you to getting being support, put in their you service. You getting support from other people who may not be as bold as you are? Are they calling you? Are they texting you saying, go, Troy, go? All the time. Really? All the time, since day one. Troy LaRavie, um, are you going to run for mayor? Right now, I have no plans on running for mayor. What about governor? Right now, I have we can't no even plans get a budget passed. Any office besides the one that I have right now. What about U.S. senator? I just said any office, brother. The only office I'm concerned about right now is the office of president of the Principals Association. And what is that responsibility? And so, it, part of my responsibility is to ensure that the voices of the principals get heard, but not just get heard, but that their voices actually have some influence in policy. Uh, principles have been isolated, uh, and when you're isolated, you can get picked off. Yeah. When you're isolated, you're just a lone voice out there. Uh -huh. and it is part of my job to ensure that these principles come together and create common positions and common stances uh, that they put out into the public sphere, that they give to CPS to say, this is the united voice of principles, and this is what we believe should happen in policy X. And hopefully that works. When it doesn't work, it's our job to build alliances with organizations and community members and parents so that the parents can then, and help the parents see the reasonableness of our policy mm. positions and how these policy positions will benefit students. It's just so they can advocate it, with us. So it, we get their power plus our power. It's just interesting how, you know, the pressure in the crucible could be put on you to say, demote him, get him out of blame, fire him, try to shut him up, and then you get elected president of the Principals Association. That, that's, that, it, it, that's like out of a Twilight Zone episode, you know? And then we don't even want to get into the Andrea Zopp thing. I'm still trying to figure that one out, you know? Uh, Andrea Zopp and the other board members, along with Common's mom, Mahalia Hines, approve a $20 million no bid contract. Andrea Zopp becomes the deputy mayor. You got to yeah. be kidding me. I actually have an interesting relationship with Andrea Zopp. Uh, I don't agree with any decision she ever made as a board member. Mm -hmm. uh, I vehemently disagree with every decision she ever made. 
But one time, um, you know, she was the president of the Urban League, uh, and she invited me to speak at an Urban League function uh, on charter schools. And, you know, I was, I'm one of the most sort of convincing <laughs> voices for our public school system. So what happened? I got about 30 seconds left. Sure. What happened? Well, uh, I did a good job there, and then she recommended that the City Club uh, invite me to speak at their panel, and that was the panel you just showed. Yes. And so it was because of her, the fact that she, she disagrees with me so much, but was open enough to having my voice heard, and when she heard it, then asked another venue, like, you should hear this person. I don't yeah. agree with him, but you should hear him. You know, there's something I respect about Yeah, it's a lot of integrity. Yeah. You know, it, it really is. And it just shows that people like you keep talking, man, keep barking, you know, because you're doing the right thing, brother. Thanks for being on Counterpoint, man. I really appreciate you, hey. Troy LaRavier. Hey, what is your passion? Thanks. Do you have fire in the belly like Troy LaRavier? Are you willing to risk everything to improve the lives of children, schools? communities, your calling is no good unless you answer the call. So drop the excuses and make a difference. Hey, I need you all to stay positive, keep your head up, and always be encouraged to voice your counterpoint. Have a great week.